An incompetent person as a president? What kind of prefab hut is your company? The lively atmosphere at the reunion froze with Todd's words. Our classmates looked at Todd in disbelief. Ha! Huh? Prefab? I said in confusion, and Todd started laughing. Yeah. He's probably just the president of a tiny company, right? The room fell silent. Why can't Todd read the room? Since long ago, Todd has looked down on me and mocked me. Today, I can't forgive him. But fate hadn't abandoned me. What awaited Todd was a surprising turn of events. My name is Luke, and I'm 40. Currently, I live with my wife, Julia, and our son, Eugene. I met Julia when I was a student. I was always shy and struggled to interact with people, but Julia actively approached me. She was bright, cute, and popular, and I was truly lucky to marry her. Meeting Julia turned my life around completely. Then, our son, Eugene, was born. Eugene just started middle school this year. He chose a private school to study French more intensively. The tuition is higher than public schools, but I'm willing to spend for Eugene's dreams. He also attends a French conversation school after regular classes. Eugene dreams of becoming a diplomat and traveling the world, so he's dedicated to studying foreign languages. For his age, he's very mature and makes me proud. Surrounded by Julia, who's cheerful and caring, and Eugene, who's kind, I lead a simple yet happy life. However, that summer, something happened. Eugene came home crying. Eugene, though, is usually very resilient and doesn't cry easily. But this time, he was sobbing uncontrollably. Julia and I were bewildered. Eugene, what happened? Even when Julia gently asked, Eugene just looked down. He bit his lip, appearing frustrated. You don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. Mom and Dad are on your side. I decided to leave him be. Upon hearing this, Eugene went back to his room. This has never happened before. Julia sighed with concern. Something must have happened at school. Though I felt helpless, I decided to wait until Eugene was ready to talk. The next day, Eugene woke up as if nothing had happened and went to school. Julia and I spent the day puzzled about the previous day's events. But that evening, Eugene came home crying again. Eugene, wasn't today the speech and debate club? Didn't you go? Eugene looked down. Then he quietly muttered. It doesn't matter if I go to the club. Julia and I exchanged glances. Why would Eugene say something like that? Eugene, who has always worked harder than anyone, saying something so defeatist isn't like him at all. It's not meaningless. Your hard work is why you're doing well in school, right? Even when I said that, Eugene shook his head. But you can't become a diplomat unless your parents are important people, right? I was taken aback. There's no truth to that. Someone must have told him, and he believed it. I smiled and said, that's not true. Even if your mom and dad aren't important people, you can become anything, including a diplomat. If you have the ability. Eugene looked surprised. Really? Is that true? Yes. I don't know who said that, but it's nonsense. Julia added. Eugene looked at us with wide eyes, like he was hit with a revelation. Great. Eugene wiped his tears and looked relieved. Wondering who fed him such nonsense, Eugene slowly began to speak. Ryan from my class said that. His dad is a company president and is running for city council. He said only people like him can become diplomats. Apparently, Ryan's father is quite an elite. Eugene thought he couldn't become a diplomat without a father like that. Even if it was said by a child, it's too outrageous. Eugene told me something even more shocking. Ryan always says terrible things to me. He even said I cheated when I got a perfect score on a test. I couldn't believe my ears. Eugene studies harder than anyone, and his test scores are excellent. It's unforgivable to say something like that. I remembered being teased the same way in the past. The truth is, I grew up without parents since birth. I was raised in a foster home. To avoid being teased for living there, I focused on studying hard. As a result, I had the top grades in my class in middle school. However, there was a classmate who didn't think well of me. The name of that classmate is Todd. 
Todd came from a privileged background and received an elite education to get into good high schools and colleges. In middle school, Todd also had good grades but couldn't surpass mine. Whenever test rankings were posted, my name was always at the top, with Todd's right behind. Upon seeing that, Todd would cause a scene in front of everyone. Luke lives in a foster home. There's no way someone like him can get good grades. He's cheating. Todd glared at me as he said that. I wasn't cheating. My good test results were due to my hard work. Yet, Todd made it seem as if I had cheated to boost my scores. However, my good attitude in classes paid off, so Mr. Harris, our homeroom teacher, didn't believe Todd and raised his voice. There's no way Luke would do something like that. Stop saying such nonsense. When Mr. Harris reprimanded him, Todd reluctantly returned to the classroom with a dissatisfied look. Since then, Todd kept provoking me. At first, I ignored him, but his insults crossed the line. Hey, poor kid. Don't come within 100 meters of me. I don't want your poverty rubbing off on me. It was unbelievable that a classmate would call me poor. Other classmates just snickered without helping me. During those times, Mr. Harris and a few kind classmates always stood by me. Mr. Harris always cared about me, knowing I was raised in a foster home. Really, Todd is such a jerk. Don't worry about him, Luke. He just envies your talent for studying. Mr. Harris's words were always warm and filled my heart. As I entered my third year of middle school and had to decide my future, my worries grew. The teachers at the foster home were very kind and part of me wanted to stay there forever. But I also felt that I couldn't rely on the home forever. I wanted to grow up quickly and become independent. During career counseling, Mr. Harris kindly said to me, there are scholarships for high school now. With your grades, you can get into a good high school or university. He showed me a scholarship pamphlet, but my mind was already made up. I decided not to continue my education and start working after middle school. I wanted to become a self-reliant adult. When I told Mr. Harris my decision, he looked a bit disappointed but supported me. If you keep your ambitions high, you'll achieve them. I know you can do it, Luke. With his words in my heart, I graduated from middle school. I haven't seen Todd since then. As I recalled those days, my chest ached. I never imagined that my beloved son, Eugene, would face similar remarks. It's often said that the nail that sticks out gets hammered down, and Eugene must be that nail. I looked straight at Eugene. Ryan is probably just jealous of you, Eugene. Don't worry about it. Ha! Huh? Jealous? Julia nodded beside me. People tend to feel envious when they see someone more capable than themselves. But Eugene, there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who strive to become like the capable person and those who act mean. Which one do you want to be? When I asked him that, Eugene immediately replied, I want to be someone who works hard to become capable. I patted Eugene on the head and said, then don't worry about Ryan. Focus on how you can improve yourself. Eugene's eyes sparkled. Got it. I'll do my best. With that, Eugene headed to his French conversation class, which he had skipped before. There are unreasonable people in this world, but it's best not to pay them any mind. Let them say what they want. I wanted Eugene to focus only on his future, ignoring those who look down on hardworking people. Since then, Eugene hasn't come home crying. One day, a speech contest was announced at Eugene's school. Unfortunately, Julia had work, so I attended alone. I headed to the school and entered the gym, which was the contest venue. Many parents were already seated. I quickly found an empty seat and sat down. Then, I felt a gaze from the seat next to me. When I turned to look, I was shocked. Sitting next to me was Todd, who had bullied me back in middle school. I pretended not to notice and faced forward, but it was too late. Todd spoke to me. Oh, your kid goes here too? It's a private school, you must be struggling with the high tuition, right? Todd looked down on me, just like in middle school. I tried to stay calm, but my hands were shaking. I have a job now so I'm not struggling financially. When I said that, Todd laughed. With just a middle school education, your job options are limited. No need to put on a brave face. As Todd was saying that, the speech contest began. 
The first speaker was Ryan, who had been teasing Eugene. Todd smirked and started setting up his video camera. Then he said something surprising to me. The first speaker is my son. He's talented, just like me. I was speechless. So Ryan was Todd's son. The saying like father, like son seemed fitting. Ryan took the stage and started his speech. But he seemed nervous, his voice was trembling. Additionally, his speech was halting, as if he hadn't memorized it. The audience was murmuring at the less than stellar speech. Todd was watching with a nervous sweat. After Ryan finished, it was Eugene's turn. Eugene had practiced hard for this day. He delivered a magnificent speech fluently using two foreign languages. When he finished, the audience erupted in applause. I had never felt prouder as a father. Todd looked astonished. As Eugene left the stage, he spotted me and waved, and I beamed back, waving. Seeing this, Todd's face showed even more surprise. After the contest ended, he said to me, Your son spoke confidently, but it's a shame he was born to a poor father like you. No matter how capable he is. Being poor means he can't do anything. I was genuinely angry, but I couldn't let my anger explode here. I chose to endure it. As I furrowed my brow, Todd provoked me further. I run a company and am running for city council. In the end, I'll be the winner. You're just a loser. I wondered what Todd was competing with me for. I had no intention of competing with him. I thought, enough is enough. And said casually, Todd, you're still impressive. Good luck. Todd looked smug. Not wanting to talk to him anymore, I quickly left the scene. A few days later, I received an email. It was an invitation to a middle school reunion. It seemed it would also celebrate Mr. Harris's retirement. Since Todd would likely attend the reunion, I hesitated. But I wanted to see Mr. Harris and congratulate him personally on his retirement. Though I was conflicted, I decided it wouldn't be right not to attend just because of Todd, so I mustered up the courage to go. On the day of the reunion, I arrived at the venue with nervous steps. The event was held at a local restaurant. Many of my classmates were already there. They hadn't changed much, all chatting happily. I looked around but didn't see Todd yet. Feeling a bit relieved, I searched for Mr. Harris. I spotted him, joyfully talking with classmates. He noticed me and approached with a happy smile. Luke, how have you been? You've grown up so well, I'm delighted. Mr. Harris put a hand on my shoulder, beaming. It's thanks to you, sir. Without you, I might not have graduated from middle school. You listened to me when I needed it. When I said that, Mr. Harris laughed. No, Luke. It's all the result of your hard work. Your efforts made it meaningful. Truly wonderful. I'm proud to have been your teacher. I felt happy to hear that from Mr. Harris. All right, before Todd arrives, I'll congratulate you on your retirement and then leave. As I thought that, there was a commotion at the entrance. I looked over and saw Todd there. Todd had finally arrived. As I was taken aback, Todd approached Mr. Harris. Oh, talking with the poor guy, huh? Todd said with a sneer. Mr. Harris was shocked by Todd's words. Todd, how can you say such rude things? The classmates around us were in an uproar. Todd continued quickly. Ha, ah, but it's true. Luke is a poor guy with just a middle school education. Everyone thinks the same, even if they don't say it. I was speechless. I couldn't believe he said such things at a reunion. Some classmates even laughed softly. Since it was true that I grew up in a foster home and didn't go to high school, I couldn't argue back. As I was about to leave, unable to stand the atmosphere, Mr. Harris raised his voice. Todd, you don't understand anything. Luke is working honorably now and contributing to society. It's wrong to call someone like that poor. Hearing Mr. Harris's words, Todd burst into laughter. If you say that, everyone is working. It's not just Luke contributing to society. I'm running a company and running for city council. I'm contributing more to society, right? The classmates were impressed by Todd's words. Wow, Todd. Running for city council, that's amazing. Mr. Harris sighed. Todd, you might be impressive, 
but you only took over your parents' company, right? You didn't work hard to become president. Luke built his own company from scratch. That effort is something extraordinary. When Mr. Harris said that, Todd and the other classmates were wide-eyed. An incompetent person as a president? What kind of prehab shed is your company in? This isn't child's play. The once lively reunion hall fell completely silent with Todd's words. Some classmates looked at Todd in disbelief. Ha! Huh? Prefab? I said in confusion, and Todd started laughing. Yeah. He's probably just the president of a tiny company, right? How rude could Todd be? He had no idea about my company, yet he said such things. As I thought that, Todd said something surprising. Hey everyone, let's go check out Luke's company after the reunion. The hall was abuzz with Todd's words, and some classmates eagerly agreed. They probably wanted to confirm if it was a prefab shed and mock me for it. I could see right through Todd's scheme. Seeing the reaction of some classmates, Todd said, we'll come over. Entertain us. We're going out of our way to see your company. How presumptuous to demand hospitality when they're coming uninvited. I can only offer tea, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. It's probably just a tiny company that can only offer tea, right? I was too stunned to say anything. Mr. Harris also seemed taken aback. The reunion continued, and I was able to congratulate Mr. Harris on his retirement. As I was leaving, Mr. Harris whispered to me, I'm so glad you've become such a strong man, Luke. You won't lose to Todd. Hold your head high and be proud. With those final words from Mr. Harris as a teacher, I felt empowered. I'll never lose to Todd. I even feel like I'm already ahead of him. When I said that, Mr. Harris smiled and left the venue. Meeting Mr. Harris had been invaluable to me. I couldn't help but hope that Mr. Harris would stay healthy and live a long life. After the reunion ended and everyone was heading home, Todd approached me with a few classmates. So, let's go see your company. There's nothing interesting to see at my company. I said, but Todd laughed. Well, we'll go check it out anyway. Todd was determined to see my company. Reluctantly, I walked with Todd and a few classmates to my company, which was not far from the venue. A few minutes later, we arrived in front of my company. Todd started laughing. See, your company looks like a shack. Todd was pointing at a small house and laughing. He seemed to be mistaken. I immediately pointed to the large building next to it. What are you talking about? My company is over there. Ha! Huh? Todd and the classmates were stunned. Isn't this a famous venture company? Is Luke the president here? If that's true, Luke, that's amazing. The classmates exclaimed in delight. Todd, on the other hand, was in disbelief. No way. Luke only has a middle school education. He must be lying. Why would I need to lie? This was an undeniable fact. No matter what I said, Todd wouldn't believe me. I thought it was no use. As I was thinking this, a woman came running towards me from the entrance of the company. Did you enjoy the reunion? I wish I could have attended too. It was Julia. Seeing Julia, Todd, and the classmates were shocked. Why is Julia, the most popular girl in class, here? Todd was so surprised that his voice was trembling. I'm the president's secretary here now. And the president is Luke, right? The classmates were leaning in eager to know the truth. Julia started laughing. What are you talking about? Of course, Luke is the president. Hearing this, Todd looked like he was about to faint from shock. After graduating middle school, I got a job at a nearby factory. But within a few years, I was laid off because I only had a middle school education. Just when I was happy to finally live an independent life, I lost my job. After that, I immediately looked for another job, but the barrier of having only a middle school education was high. No company would interview me after just seeing my resume. I was frustrated. Even with just a middle school education, I was good at studying and could do many jobs. Why wouldn't anyone hire me? I was filled with a sense of helplessness. At that time, I suddenly remembered something Mr. Harris had said. He said that if you aim high, you can achieve it. If no company would hire me, 
I would create my own. Thinking that, I immediately took action. Having never studied business management, I devoured countless specialized books and finally established my current company. When I first started, I worked alone in my apartment. Managing a company meant I had to handle everything from finances to clients by myself. The workload was unimaginable. I worked tirelessly, hardly sleeping. It was a few years into running the company that it started gaining traction. The number of employees grew, and we rented an office, slightly expanding the company's size. It was around that time that I reunited with Julia. Julia worked for one of my company's clients and came to my company for a business meeting. Back in middle school, Julia often protected me from Todd's teasing. She was my first love back then. Seeing her in front of me, I couldn't believe my eyes and immediately asked her out for tea. We hit it off, started dating, and eventually got married. Now, Julia helps me as the company's secretary. Julia glared at Todd. Are you surprised that Luke, whom you used to tease as a poor guy, is now the president of a leading company in the industry? Julia said calmly. Todd was clearly agitated. No, that's not it. But a company founded by a poor, middle school graduate like Luke won't last long, will it? I just feel sorry for him. Julia's face twisted in anger. Are you serious? Todd, your company does business with Luke's company. If we cut ties with you, your company would suffer greatly. Why don't you show some gratitude to Luke? Todd turned pale upon hearing Julia's words. The deal with Luke's company was something the previous president arranged. But mixing business with personal matters isn't good. I have nothing to thank Luke for. Why should I thank a middle school graduate like him? I wasn't seeking gratitude, but his words were too harsh. When Todd said that, Julia looked at him in disbelief. Then, she erupted in anger. You don't understand anything. I never thought you could be such a horrible person. When Julia said that, Todd said something outrageous. Why don't you work at my company instead of this middle school graduates? I'll treat you well as my secretary. Plus, I'm the next city council candidate. I have a promising future. Julia sighed. I refuse. I want to stay by my husband Luke's side. Todd's eyes widened at this. Ha! Huh? Luke is, your husband. The classmates were also shocked. Yes, he is. Is there a problem? Julia said, taunting Todd. Julia, the most popular girl in class marrying a middle school graduate like him. It's a pity. Don't you all think so? Todd tried to get the classmates to agree, but none of them did. When I become a city council member, I plan to get rid of people like Luke who work with just a middle school education from this town. What is this guy talking about? I was genuinely angry. I had reached my limit. I took a deep breath and raised my voice. I will never allow that. There's no way someone like you could become a city council member. Ha! Huh? My company has been active in this town for years. Everyone will vote for me. Don't talk nonsense. Todd's face was getting redder. Then, Julia raised her voice, not backing down. Hey, you know my father is a city council member, right? He has been for years and is loved by the residents. Of course, I know that. Luke is also running for city council with my father's endorsement, Julia said. Todd and the classmates looked at us in disbelief. Is that true? There's no way Luke could get elected as a city council member. Todd seemed to think I was joking about running for city council. Yes, Julia's father, who was a city council member, had indeed encouraged me to run. At first, I thought there was no way I could become a city council member. But if becoming one would improve this town, I wanted to do it. Oh, really? I've heard rumors that Todd uses his company's money to live it up and that he has quite the nightlife despite having a wife. Julia said with a knowing smile. The classmates exchanged glances. Who said that? Just town gossip. This town has many eyes. You should be more careful. Trust is the most important thing for a city council member. Well, I have work to do, Julia said as she walked into the company. Todd bit his lower lip in frustration. I appreciate the business we've done up to now, but as of today, 
we're canceling our dealings with your company. I don't want to do business with a company that can't show gratitude, I said. What? I told you, business and personal matters are separate. Keep the business going. I was shocked at Todd's condescending tone. Any normal person would apologize. Instead, Todd was getting angry. The classmates watched the scene unfold with bated breath. Staying calm, I said, no, the deal is off. That's final. Now, I have work to do, so I'm leaving. Suddenly, Todd started apologizing. Sorry, sorry, my tone was off. Don't cancel the deal. We're friends, right? Let's keep doing business together. When did Todd and I become friends? Todd's shallowness is exhausting. I walked away without looking back, and the classmates awkwardly dispersed. Todd stood there, stunned. The city council general election was held two weeks later. To my surprise, I was elected as a city council member. I ran on a platform of creating a town where children wouldn't struggle. I was thrilled that my message reached the citizens. Many residents celebrated my election. On the other hand, Todd lost to me by a large margin and was not elected. Someone who looks down on others could never represent the citizens. It was an expected result. It was said that Todd collapsed to his knees in shock after losing. After our company cut ties, Todd's company's performance plummeted. The company's size was reduced, and it continued to run at a loss. Despite numerous apologies from Todd, I never met him again. His son Ryan, ashamed of his father's downfall, stopped attending school and became reclusive. If Ryan ever realizes he shouldn't follow in his father's footsteps and decides to change, I want to create a society where he can find support when he needs it. They prove that a boastful person with money doesn't always have a bright future. Meanwhile, I stay busy as the company president. I'm always busy, but Julia supports me wholeheartedly, and I'm happy every day. Eugene excels in French and will study abroad next year. Julia and I will always support Eugene as he gets closer to his dreams. My life has been full of hardships, but God never gives us trials we can't overcome. I will continue to walk through the rest of my life with gratitude, working hard every step of the way. My name is Alex. I've been dating Emily since our school days, and it's been five years now. My feelings for her have grown stronger every day. And I want to spend the rest of my life with her. Today, I came to greet you as my future in-laws. Thank you for taking the time to see me. This was when I went to Emily's parents' house to ask for their blessing. I tried to remain calm and said this. Perhaps because of my greeting, Emily's mother gave me a warm smile and said, Oh, what a pleasant young man. Thank you for taking the time to come. Please, make yourself at home. I was very happy to receive such kind words from her. Thank you. But we won't stay long. As I said this to Emily's mother, Emily's father glared at me. We don't need him to stay long. Hey, Jenny, don't be so welcoming. He said this to Emily's mother. The atmosphere instantly became tense. Emily, her mother, and I all looked down and fell silent. After a moment, Emily's mother spoke again. Victor is right, we haven't asked about his profession yet. We need to make sure you're suitable for the Johnson family. Just because Emily likes you doesn't mean anyone can marry into our family. Emily retorted against her mother's statement. What is that supposed to mean? I've always said I hate that kind of talk. I have the right to marry the person I love. And I don't want you or dad interfering. I didn't even want to come here in the first place. Her father then shouted. Don't be so cheeky. Listen, Emily, you don't understand the weight of being a Johnson. No matter how much you talk about freedom, the fact remains that whoever you marry will become part of our family. You have no right to bring disgrace to us. Didn't you learn not to cause trouble for others in school? The situation was already chaotic, I thought. Emily was tearing up. I couldn't bear to see my future wife so upset, and I started to panic a little. I began explaining my job to reassure her parents. Mr. Johnson, Mrs. Johnson, I'm sorry for causing any concern. I run an IT company. Besides myself, I have three employees, but... Before I could finish, Emily's father interrupted me. 
What? You call yourself a CEO with just three employees? Pathetic. I stopped speaking, cut off by his words. Forget about the wedding and just leave. You're wasting our time. He continued. Emily shouted. That's awful, Dad. How can you say such things? I've had enough. I've known for a long time that talking to you is pointless. I'm at my limit. I'll leave this house and cut ties with you. After saying that, she sat down and covered her face and started crying. I felt terrible for making Emily so sad. However, Mrs. Johnson stepped in, saying, Hey, Victor. There's no need to talk like that while Alex is speaking. I'm sorry, Alex. My husband can be quite harsh. Her supportive words gave me a glimmer of hope, but convincing her stubborn father seemed incredibly difficult. Quiet. Just leave. I run a company with 100 employees. How dare you call yourself a CEO in front of me? You're a shallow and extremely rude person. I can tell you're not suitable for the Johnson family. Get out. Emily's father glared at me as he said this. As I stood there, unsure what to do, he stood up and threatened me. So I decided it was best to leave before things got worse and Emily got more upset. Well then, I'll take my leave for today. I'll come back soon to greet you properly. I said this and heading for the door. A complete defeat. However, the next day, something unexpected happened. My name is Alex Smith, 27 years old. I've been dating Emily Johnson, whom I met in college, for five years, and I'm considering marriage. Emily is bright, friendly, and always natural, a wonderful woman. I've been bragging a bit about my girlfriend, but when I started thinking about marriage, Emily started worrying about her family. Emily's father is the CEO of a small to medium-sized company. He's an old-fashioned, arrogant man who always believes he's the most important, both at work and at home, as Emily describes him. Emily also has an older sister who graduated from a prestigious university in the city and worked at a big company before marrying an elite businessman last year. Emily told me their wedding was a luxurious party on a cruise ship with many celebrities attending. Alex, do you want to attend my sister's wedding party? At the time, when Emily asked me if I wanted to attend her sister's wedding party, I politely declined since I wasn't her husband yet. Despite her family's glamorous lifestyle, Emily herself is quite down to earth. She even said, I don't see the point of having a wedding party on a luxury cruise ship. I'd prefer a simple wedding. Our dates were no exception. She preferred casual dining like family restaurants or ramen shops over fancy places. I feel more comfortable at a family restaurant or a ramen shop than at a fancy restaurant. For Christmas dinner, she requested delivery from a famous chain restaurant. Perhaps this is her way of rebelling against her lavish upbringing. Well, it doesn't matter to me whether Emily is from a wealthy family or not. My feelings of love for her remain the same either way. As spring came, our anniversary approached. True to form, Emily didn't want to spend much money, but I suggested, let's try some fancy Italian food for a change. And reserved a table at an Italian restaurant with a sea view for our anniversary dinner. As we finished our meal, I pulled a small box from my pocket. Emily, thank you for being with me all this time. Will you marry me? I took out a ring from the small box. Emily's face lit up with joy. This is an engagement ring? It's beautiful. Thank you, Alex. She said this with tears in her eyes and immediately slipped the ring onto her left ring finger, gazing at it dreamily. Is the size okay? I chose a design based on your hints, but I was worried if you'd like it. When I asked this, Emily replied, anything you give me makes me happy, Alex. I'd be thrilled even with a ring made of wire. Wire might be a bit much, but thank you for saying that. When I said this, Emily responded, really, anything from you makes me happy. Just being with you is enough for me. I felt incredibly happy, realizing again that we were a truly loving couple. By the way, did I get your answer to my proposal? Caught up in her excitement over the ring, I realized I hadn't heard her reply. Answer to your proposal? Emily looked puzzled. Yes. I'd like to hear your answer properly. When I said this, Emily replied. I'd love to get married, but. 
Her mood suddenly dropped despite just having enjoyed the ring. Um, does that mean there's a chance we can't get married? I felt my mood drop too, and worried by her response. It's just my parents. Emily said this and looked down in silence. Emily, I'll convince your parents. I'll do my best because I want to be with you. I held Emily's hand. She lifted the corners of her mouth slightly and said, thank you. By the time I could visit her parents, a month had passed since my proposal. Apparently, Emily had a hard time bringing it up to her parents, which caused the delay. As expected, when Emily told her parents, Dad, Mom, I have someone I want to marry, and I'd like you to meet him, her father reportedly said. So you think he's worthy of meeting me? He must be quite the man. Her mother added, we won't tolerate anything that brings shame to our family. Hearing this from Emily, I thought to myself that this would be tough, but I resolved to marry into such a well-bred family. Two years ago, I started my own company. In short, I'm the CEO. But it's a small company with just four friends, so it doesn't have the usual corporate hierarchy. My parents are a pain. Maybe we should just elope. Emily suggested. Don't joke about that. We can't do that. I'll do my best to win your parents over. It'll be fine. I said this to Emily to reassure her and also to bolster my own confidence. On the day I went to meet her parents, I decided that wearing a suit would be too formal. So I wore a collarless casual jacket over a light blue shirt with chinos. Standing in front of the apartment door with the Johnson nameplate in an upscale part of town, I took a deep breath. All right. I rang the doorbell. Since Emily still lived with her parents, my mission was to go into the Johnson house alone. Yes? I heard Emily's voice as she opened the door for me. Come in. I put on the slippers Emily had prepared for me and nervously followed her into the living room. An older man was sitting on the living room sofa with his arms and legs crossed. He was probably Emily's father. In the kitchen, an older woman was making tea. I assumed she was Emily's mother. Alex, this is my father and mother. Dad, Mom, this is Alex. Emily looked uneasy and introduced me to her parents. My name is Alex. I've been dating Emily since our school days, and it's been five years now. My feelings for her have grown stronger every day. And I want to spend the rest of my life with her. Today, I came to greet you as my future in-laws. Thank you for taking the time to see me. I was nervous, but I tried to remain calm as I spoke. I knew my greeting was long and formal, but given that they likely didn't have a good impression of me, I thought it best to convey my intentions clearly. Perhaps because of my greeting, Emily's mother softened her stern expression and said, Oh, what a pleasant young man. Thank you for taking the time to come. Please, make yourself at home. I was very happy to receive such kind words from her. Thank you. But I won't stay long. As I said this, Emily's father glared at me. We don't need him to stay long. Hey, Jenny, don't be so welcoming. He said this to Emily's mother. The atmosphere instantly became tense. Emily, her mother, and I all looked down and fell silent. After a moment, Emily's mother spoke again. Victor is right, we haven't asked about your profession yet. We need to make sure you're suitable for the Johnson family. Just because Emily likes you doesn't mean anyone can marry into our family. Emily retorted against her mother's statement. What is that supposed to mean? I've always said I hate that kind of talk. I have the right to marry the person I love. And I don't want mom or dad interfering. I didn't even want to come here in the first place. Emily's father then shouted. Don't be so cheeky. Listen, Emily, you don't understand the weight of being a Johnson. No matter how much you talk about freedom. The fact remains that whoever you marry will become part of our family. You have no right to bring disgrace to us. Didn't you learn not to cause trouble for others in school? The situation was already chaotic, I thought. Emily was tearing up. I couldn't bear to see my future wife so upset, and I started to panic a little. I began explaining my job to reassure her parents. Mr. Johnson, Mrs. Johnson, I'm sorry for causing any concern. I run an IT company. Besides myself, I have three employees, but... Before I could finish, Emily's father interrupted me. 
What? You call yourself a CEO with just three employees? Pathetic. I stopped speaking, cut off by his words. Forget about the wedding and just leave. You're wasting our time. He continued. Emily shouted. That's awful, Dad. How can you say such things? I've had enough. I've known for a long time that talking to you is pointless. I'm at my limit. I'll leave this house and cut ties with you. After saying that, she sat down and covered her face and started crying. I felt terrible for making Emily so sad. However, Mrs. Johnson stepped in, saying, Hey, Victor. There's no need to talk like that while Alex is speaking. I'm sorry, Alex. My husband can be quite harsh. Her supportive words gave me a glimmer of hope, but convincing Emily's stubborn father seemed incredibly difficult. Quiet. Just leave. I run a company with 100 employees. How dare you call yourself a CEO in front of me? You're a shallow and extremely rude person. I can tell you're not suitable for the Johnson family. Get out. Mr. Johnson glared at me as he said this. As I stood there, unsure what to do, he stood up and threatened me. So I decided it was best to leave before things got worse and Emily got more upset. Well then, I'll take my leave for today. I'll come back soon to greet you properly. I headed towards the entrance. I was deeply concerned about Emily, but she said to her father, for now, I'm going with Alex. I'll pack my things and leave later. As she tried to leave with me. Calm down, Emily. I'm on your side. Let's talk this through with your dad. Emily's mother persuaded her. I also thought that if Emily left with me now, it would only provoke her father further, so I said, I'll do my best to win your parents' approval. So please stay with them today. Persuaded by both her mother and me, Emily reluctantly agreed, and I left alone. I knew getting their approval wouldn't be easy, but I couldn't help but feel disheartened. That evening, I exchanged a few messages with Emily. She wrote, I'm sorry for making you feel bad even though you came all this way today, and I replied, no, I'm sorry. I'll do my best to get their approval for our marriage. Although she read the message, she didn't reply after that. I worried and thought negatively, wondering, what if her parents convinced Emily to break up with me after that? But I also tried to stay positive, thinking, her mother was more supportive than I expected, and maybe she'll help sway her father's opinion. I hated the idea of not being able to be with the one I loved because of family opposition. It wasn't just stubbornness, I truly wanted to continue loving Emily as my lifelong partner. I couldn't sleep much that night, and I went to work with rubbing my sleepy eyes the next morning. I was planning to visit Harris Corporation this morning, but our new client can only meet this morning, so I'm in a bind. David, one of our employees and a college friend, said this as he arrived at the office before me. Got it. I don't have anything urgent this morning, so I can go to one of them for you. When I offered, David said, thanks, I'd appreciate that. I need to handle the new clients since I initiated the contact. Can you take care of Harris Corporation? We typically divided tasks like this but cooperated flexibly depending on the situation. Harris Corporation, an old parts manufacturer, had reached out about upgrading their system about six months ago. And we had been providing IT services for the past five months. We had planned to visit them for a maintenance review this week, but due to our busy schedule, David hoped to handle it today. After getting the details from David, I called Harris Corporation and scheduled an appointment. I promised to visit at 11.30 a.m., gathered the necessary materials, and left the office. Driving was more convenient, so I headed to their company by car, parked in a nearby coin-operated parking lot, and walked from there. I was feeling sluggish from last night's lack of sleep, but I couldn't let that affect me. I gathered my energy and walked around to the entrance from the back of the company. All right, this is the place, I muttered to myself as the automatic doors opened. What I saw next was shocking. Ha! Huh? I involuntarily exclaimed. Inside the entrance stood a line of men in suits, as if they had been waiting for me. I was stunned and wondered, what are they going to do to me? Unsure whether to run, I stood frozen. One of the men stepped forward and said loudly, we deeply apologize, followed by all the men bowing deeply in unison. Wait, what? I was completely bewildered, but I thought maybe something had happened to harm our company. 
I wondered if David had missed something in the handover or if it was something even he didn't know about. Is there some trouble with my company? I'm Alex from Truth Corporation. Usually, David handles this account, but today I'm. As I introduced myself and handed my business card to the man who spoke, he replied. Thank you. I'm Henry, the executive director of this company. This isn't about a company issue but a personal matter. We heard that our president was very rude to you recently. After discussing it with several executives, we decided to apologize. We were going to visit you, but when we heard you were coming today, we decided to greet and apologize to you here. Your president was rude to me? I have no recollection of that. I was completely bewildered. Then I saw a man hurriedly running from the back of the company towards me. As soon as he reached me, he deeply apologized. I'm so sorry. Please, don't cancel our contract. When he raised his head, I recognized him instantly. Wait. Mr. Johnson. I exclaimed in shock. There was no mistaking it, as I had just met him yesterday. The man was none other than Emily's father. Mr. Johnson's company is... Harris Corporation. I didn't realize because the company name wasn't Johnson. I'm shocked. I said in a daze. Mr. Johnson looked very different from his stern demeanor yesterday and said with a tearful expression. My subordinates insisted on apologizing to you. I never imagined you'd come here yourself. You're here to cancel our contract, right? Please. Don't do that. I'll even approve your marriage to Emily. Please, I beg you. Mr. Johnson deeply begged me again. I hurriedly said, please calm down, Mr. Johnson. Then I explained, I'm not here to cancel our contract. I'm just here to handle maintenance and have a discussion in place of David. I had no intention of ending our partnership. Mr. Johnson, looking relieved, replied, really? If we had to switch systems now, the costs would be enormous. Our company is already struggling. And that would push us into bankruptcy. I was astonished by this coincidence. I wasn't completely uninformed about this client, as David had given me some details. Harris Corporation was founded 20 years ago by President Harris. With an older workforce, they had continued using analog systems until recently. However, unable to keep up with the times, they hired an external consulting firm which recommended a complete system overhaul for better management. That's when Henry reached out to our company. Then David took the initial call and became their point of contact. Our IT management system has been growing in demand domestically, with several major companies adopting it. Despite being run by just four people, our company generates higher annual revenue than many older mid-sized firms, consistently turning a profit and growing steadily. We've been getting more media coverage, and while I'm not personally famous because we have another employee handling PR, our company has been gaining recognition. Wait, so the president here isn't Mr. Harris? When I asked that question, Mr. Johnson replied. No, Mr. Harris became chairman, and I was appointed president 10 years ago. My father knew Mr. Harris, so I got the job through connections. I didn't really understand the business at first. Henry has been supporting me, but we've faced many challenges. However, since implementing your system, our situation has dramatically improved. You're a savior. I understood better now. Emily had only told me her father was a company president, I had no idea of the details. I had assumed her family was wealthy, but their business was struggling. How come you didn't recognize me as the president of your client's company yesterday, but you do today? I asked another question. Mr. Johnson replied, after you left, Emily was furious and told me, Alex's company may be small, but it's amazing. You wouldn't know because you're stuck in the old ways. His company is famous in the industry and makes much more money than yours. At first, I dismissed it, but Emily kept insisting. I asked her the name of your company and was shocked to realize it was one of our key partners. He continued. Last night, I considered calling to apologize immediately, but I wasn't sure how it would look to change my stance so quickly. This morning, I discussed it with Henry, who said, Victor, what have you done? Our company's survival is at stake. 
we need to apologize right away. I was hesitant, but Henry and the other executives prepared to apologize. Then you called to say you were visiting in two hours, and I thought it was over. I assumed you were coming to terminate the contract. Hearing this, I understood the situation. However, I still had doubts. Was Mr. Johnson apologizing only to save his company? Or did he genuinely care about Emily's happiness and his family's well-being? If he was allowing the marriage just to save his business, he was using his daughter for personal gain. Mr. Johnson, what do Emily and Mrs. Johnson think about this? I asked. He replied, They think it's too convenient to suddenly change my stance for the company's sake. My wife hasn't spoken to me since last night. And Emily packed her things and left this morning. I was shocked. Emily left? Where did she go? I anxiously checked my phone. I hoped for a message or call from Emily. But there was nothing. I felt uneasy. Well, I didn't plan to cancel the contract, so let's proceed with the scheduled maintenance and discussion. Henry, has there been any trouble with our system? I wanted to finish quickly and check on Emily. No, everything's fine. Any minor issues have been resolved through your technical support center. Henry answered. All right, I'll just do a quick inspection inside. Can you accompany me? I said, and Henry showed me around the company. There were no issues, so I completed my task. Thank you, I'll take my leave now. Leaving Mr. Johnson in his flustered state, I got into my car and hurried home. I took out my keys and unlocked the door. There was a pair of women's shoes in the entryway. I sighed in relief. Alex, aren't you supposed to be at work? It's still noon. Emily appeared from inside. She looked a bit shy and said, I'm sorry. I left home in a huff and didn't know where else to go, so I thought I'd stay with you for a while. I'll find an apartment soon. Can I stay here for now? I laughed and said, what are you talking about? We're getting married, right? Why would my wife need to find an apartment? You can stay here as long as you want. When I said that, Emily started crying as if she had been holding her tears back. As I comforted Emily, I told her about the unexpected encounter at her father's company and how he had apologized to me while kneeling. I also shared what Mr. Johnson had said. Emily, looking sad, said, Dad, after I told him about your company, his face turned pale. If he felt bad, he should have apologized right away instead of leaving it to Henry. It's so pathetic. I tried to console her, saying, but he did apologize as soon as he knew I was coming. However, Emily replied, he's only doing it for himself. He apologized because it would be bad for the company, not because he cares about us. I couldn't disagree with her, so I remained silent. But having Emily staying at my place indefinitely without resolving things wasn't a good situation either. I wanted to marry Emily with everyone's blessing, not by running away. For now, I felt relieved knowing Emily was safe, so I went back to work in the afternoon. I told David about the coincidence of the client being Emily's father and the apology incident. David was shocked, saying, wow, that's crazy. But since Emily's father want to use our system for his company, we can probably keep the upper hand in this relationship. I agreed that there shouldn't be any issues with the business. The real problem was how to handle the family situation. A few days passed. While staying at my place, Emily continued going to work. One evening, when I returned home, I noticed a luxury car parked in the visitor parking lot of my apartment complex. When I took the elevator to my floor, I saw a couple standing in front of my door. As I approached them cautiously, the woman bowed to me, and I realized it was Emily's sister, Melissa. Oh. It's been a while. Hi, Melissa. I had met Melissa a few times before. However, I had never met the man standing next to her. Hello. Nice to meet you. I'm Tom, Melissa's husband. I had a hunch, and it turned out to be true. This man was Melissa's husband. He was wearing a stylish suit made from what looked like high-quality fabric. I guessed that the luxury car in the underground parking lot belonged to Tom. Sorry for the sudden visit. I heard from Mom that Emily had argued with Dad and left home, so I was worried. I didn't want to trouble you, Alex. Melissa explained. 
Thinking it wasn't right to keep them standing at the door, I invited them inside. Emily was already home from work. Melissa and Tom hadn't contacted Emily beforehand, fearing she'd refuse to see them, so she was surprised by their unannounced visit. Melissa had been to my apartment with Emily before, so she remembered the place. Since they were here, we ordered takeout and had dinner together. During the meal, some surprising truths came to light. Although dad acts all high and mighty, our family was quite poor until I got a job. I went to college on a scholarship. Melissa revealed. I had assumed Emily's family was wealthy, so I was shocked. I thought your family was rich, I said. Emily replied, I never told you that, Alex. She was right, I had just assumed it because her father was a president and her sister was married to a wealthy man. And yet, he talks about suitable marriage partners for the Johnson family. It's ridiculous. My parents are financially stable now thanks to Tom and me. Melissa added, making another startling statement. Really? I was surprised again. After graduating from college and landing a job at an elite company, Melissa had started contributing financially to her parents' household, significantly improving their situation. On top of that, marrying Tom, who also worked for an elite company, made them a high-earning power couple. We decided not to have children, so we use our extra money to support our parents. But dad's been getting carried away with it. Maybe we should stop helping him. Melissa said. Listening to all this, I started feeling a bit sorry for Mr. Johnson. He was given the company through a connection but couldn't manage it well, and lives a life of pretense. Even his daughter and wife had grown exasperated with him. Talking with my sister-in-law and her husband gave me clarity on how to resolve this situation. Six months later, Emily and I submitted our marriage registration at the city hall, officially becoming husband and wife. We moved out of our old apartment and into a more convenient one together. We are happily living our married life in our new home. Emily's parents live on the same floor in the same building. I rented a unit under my name for them. Despite initially planning not to have children, Melissa is now pregnant. Emily's parents moved out of their old apartment after I bought a new one for them. I now earn more than my sister-in-law and her husband, and we've had many discussions and completely reconciled with Emily's parents. Emily's father realized he had been overconfident after Melissa and Tom stopped their financial support. With our company's system in place, Mr. Johnson's business began to recover, and he started working earnestly and became kinder to his family. I provided business advice and even some financial support to help his company succeed. Mr. Johnson was grateful and genuinely regretted his initial intimidating behavior towards me. Mrs. Johnson, who had been riding on the coattails of her husband's behavior, also had a change of heart. Both of them now see me not as an unsuitable fiancé but as a savior who helped the Johnson family. We've put the past behind us and are now a close-knit family. Technically, Emily and I are well off enough to be considered wealthy, but Emily still wants to eat chain restaurants food for Christmas this year. We'll have a modest home party with takeout and some champagne from the supermarket. As long as we're together, we're happy no matter what we do. Then, despite her imposing suit, she looked up at me with a sorrowful expression. Her long eyelashes came so close that I thought they might touch me. I'm moving in here from today, she declared with teary eyes. A rare departure from her usual confident self. I was taken aback by her unexpected words, but her earnest plea made me. My name is Tom. I'm a 26-year-old chef working at the fancy restaurant Jua. The restaurant is highly regarded for its wedding receptions, and I've been working here for two years now. As a chef, it's a rewarding place to work. However, ever since the previous head chef, Alex, retired six months ago, the work environment has become a bit challenging. The reason is. Oh no, not again. While checking the refrigerator, I found something terrible. A bug was at the bottom of a salad tray. I reported it to Stephen, the head chef, but he just gave his usual dismissive response, huh? A bug? It means it's fresh. Secretly, I removed and discarded the damaged parts. Why secretly, you ask? Once, when I was removing damaged parts, Stephen scolded me, what a waste. If it's edible, don't throw it away. Henry has strictly ordered me to cut costs and reduce food waste. Don't waste anything. Since then, 
I've been secretly disposing of damaged parts. Stephen is the nephew of the owner, Henry. In other words, he got his position through connections. He claims to be proficient in Japanese, Italian, and French cuisine, having worked at various places. Indeed, his cooking is competent, but his attitude toward ingredients is terrible. Of course, we never serve anything inedible, but we often serve things that are barely acceptable. I can't stand that. Alex was very meticulous, so I could focus on my work without worrying about ingredient management. But recently, I've been anxious, so I come in early to check the fridge. I just don't want to serve customers bug-ridden salads. That's why I keep checking the fridge. I know Stephen doesn't like that. Once the restaurant opens, it's a whirlwind of activity. We operate mainly by reservation, but we get many walk-ins as well. We also receive orders outside the course menu, so I have to pay attention to the speed and order of service. It's a hectic but exhilarating time, where I work hard while keeping my mind sharp. In the midst of this busy kitchen, a sharp voice cuts through the air. Hey! Please redo this plating. The voice belongs to Lynn. She's 28 years old. She's the floor chief of Jua. Henry recruited her from a nice hotel even I have heard of because he was impressed by her service. She's a woman who provides very meticulous and perfect customer service, but she is incredibly strict. Extremely strict. When I was new, she once scolded me harshly for missing a drop of sauce on a plate during plating. She scolded me, saying, don't ruin the customer's extraordinary experience. I felt ashamed of my lack of awareness. But secretly, I thought she didn't need to be so harsh and I pouted behind her back. And she seems to glare at me whenever she can, or so it feels. I feel like she's always watching my work closely, which makes me work even more meticulously. I've become quick and thorough thanks to her, but she still scares me. However, I share her dedication to speaking up for the sake of the customers, and I respect that. Looking at the plate Lynn was holding, it seemed to be ice cream. It was slightly melted, which was the problem. Stephen glanced at the plate and said, we can serve that. Ice cream tastes best when it's slightly melted. And quickly returned to his station. Lynn, undeterred, argued back, no. This is a dessert the customers have been looking forward to. Please don't ruin their enjoyable experience. Stephen clicked his tongue and reluctantly ordered a new serving of ice cream. Stephen is somewhat weak against Lynn. He knows that Henry specifically hired her, and he's been told about it. Judging by his sour expression, it's clear that Stephen doesn't like Lynn. It was a time when the peak hours of the day had passed, and we had a bit of breathing room. Stephen. It's about time to serve the birthday dessert plate, Lynn's voice called out. Indeed, the reservation list mentioned a birthday plate for today. However, Stephen casually muttered, Oh, I forgot. The kitchen buzzed slightly, and Stephen directed, Tom, write something appropriate with chocolate sauce on a cake plate, to me. I could see Lynn trembling with anger. Before Lynn's angry voice could echo through the kitchen, I shouted, please give me a moment. I prepared a small pan with sugar and water. As I quickly worked, I confirmed the birthday girl's name. I had to be precise and fast to make it work. I presented the finished plate to Lynn. Wow, she murmured. On the plate were a cake, fruits, and a candy sculpture spelling out Mary. I decorated the cake with lattice and heart-shaped sugar sculptures. I thought it turned out to be a vibrant dessert plate. Thank you, Lynn said, taking the plate swiftly and leaving. I watched her for a moment before returning to my tasks. I heard a cheer for the dessert plate and felt a bit relieved. Even though it was a rushed job, I was glad they enjoyed it. I almost smiled. But soon after I returned to my work, a complaint came in. The salad was wilted. I was responsible for today's salads. I thought I had checked everything before serving. When I checked the salad, I realized. It was terrible. I heard an angry voice, Tom, what are you doing? I didn't remember serving such a salad, so I was about to defend myself when I glanced at the sink. Greens can wilt during service. I had placed slightly wilted vegetables in a separate container. That container was now empty. Maybe. I picked up the container. Stephen, do you know what happened to the vegetables in this container? Stephen smirked and said, no idea. He's lying. 
I saw him move towards the salad station while I was making the sugar sculpture. I thought, what's he doing? I hope he doesn't do anything unnecessary, so I'm sure of it. Stephen must have set me up. Maybe he didn't like that I took charge with the dessert plate. I gave up defending myself and apologized to the customer. The customer forgave me, and I returned to the kitchen, finishing the remaining tasks. After the service ended, I told Stephen. I'll take responsibility and resign. I'm exhausted. I'm done working in such a place. Stephen, who lacks responsibility for ingredients. Stephen, who causes trouble for customers with his petty harassment. Working under someone like him, I can't achieve my dream. My dream is to make customers smile with my cooking. That's not possible here. Feeling utterly fed up, I handed in my resignation. Maybe Stephen would reflect on his actions after seeing me leave. I thought that, but... What? Resign. I won't let you resign. You're fired. Don't come in tomorrow, he yelled, his face contorted with anger. There's no way Stephen would reflect on anything. Wait a minute. Stephen. I can't believe Tom made that salad. His salads are always. Lynn tried to speak up, but Stephen interrupted her. Shut up, Lynn. Just because Henry likes you doesn't mean you can interfere. What do you know? Because of me, Lynn was getting yelled at. Lynn still seemed to have more to say, but I appreciated her deeply saying, thank you for everything. Your strictness, meticulousness, and kindness have been very educational. Then I headed to the staff room. I gathered my few belongings from the locker and left the restaurant Jua. I felt a bit down, but I decided to see this as an opportunity. I've always wanted to open my own restaurant someday. A heartfelt place, the exact opposite of Stevens. That became my new motivation. Immediately after quitting the restaurant, I started looking for a property. After searching extensively, I found a small property in an alleyway that could serve as both an accommodation and a small restaurant. It's a bit small, but I don't intend to hire many employees. Initially, managing it by myself might be enough. That way, I can interact with customers and understand their preferences better. With a clear image of the new restaurant, I decided on this property. However, there was one problem. The property is close to the restaurant Jua. It's on the backside of the alley, hard to see from the main street, but still very close. After some consideration, I pointed towards Jua and declared, all right, let's do this. Even though it's a one-man operation in a tiny place and no real competition, making the declaration lifted my spirits. I moved into the second floor of the property and started setting up the first floor as a restaurant. With limited funds, I did as much as I could by myself. As the place slowly took shape, I felt excited. One day, during these busy times. Tom? I turned around to a familiar voice and saw Lynn standing there, looking surprised. I was in the middle of wallpapering, drenched in sweat and wearing work clothes. I waved at her briefly and was about to restart work. But Lynn, well, she's no longer my chief. Lynn hesitantly opened the door and stepped inside. I was stunned, and she looked around the shop, asking, what are you doing? I'm opening a restaurant. I replied briefly. To be honest, I haven't talked much with Lynn, so I wasn't sure what tone to use. Do you mean your own restaurant? She asked, and I nodded yes. You were always good at your job. Your own place, that's amazing. I was a bit surprised. I didn't know Lynn thought I was good at my job. Thanks. I was too surprised to come up with anything clever to say. The conversation wasn't going anywhere. It was my fault. Did you attend culinary school, Tom? Lynn asked, and I answered. I went to culinary school for two years, then trained in France for about five years. When I said that, Lynn was extremely surprised. Five years. In France. Are you fluent in French? I wondered what she was focusing on, but I replied, I wouldn't say fluent. I worked hard to pick up words and get by. Yes, I was really focused. I got known as the American who always made the dishes sparkle and slowly made friends and learned a lot from them. When I shared a bit about my time in France, Lynn laughed. Your dishwashing is meticulous, Tom. 
So, that was from your training in France or maybe from America? I blushed a bit at her words. Despite being the floor chief, she noticed even the small tasks. Lynn was feared as a strict supervisor, often driving away new hires within three days with her rigorous training. I had only ever been scolded by her, so learning she acknowledged me secretly made me a bit happy. Are you planning to hire anyone? Lynn asked, and I told her I'd be working alone for now. After thinking for a moment, she left, saying she had work to do. The next day. In my pajamas, I came downstairs to check the mailbox outside, and was shocked. Lynn was standing in front of the restaurant. She was in an expensive-looking suit. How long had she been there? I hurriedly opened the door and asked, what brings you here? Lynn looked at me straight and said, I quit my job at Jua. Not understanding what she meant, I invited Lynn inside the restaurant which was still unfurnished to avoid standing outside. Once inside, Lynn had straightened her back and politely asked. The restaurant floor was still unfinished, with bare concrete exposed. There she was, in her expensive-looking suit, telling me something outrageous. As I panicked, she exclaimed, please take me on as your apprentice. An apprentice? I was taken aback. Lynn is older than me and an expert in hospitality. What could she possibly want to learn from me? As I stood there speechless, Lynn lifted her head a bit and started talking. I always wanted to be a pastry chef. But I'm very clumsy, so I gave up. I decided to excel in hospitality to stay involved with food. But shortly after you came to Jua, I saw your sugar work. She was probably referring to the sugar art I made as decorations for a restaurant wedding. I had begged the head chef at the time, Tyler, to let me do it. I love making sugar art. I was deeply moved by your work. Since then, I've been watching your work closely. Wait. I thought she was glaring at me all this time. She was actually watching over me. Her gaze had been so sharp, too sharp, actually. Ignoring my confusion, Lynn continued. I may be clumsy, but I'll do my best. Please hire me. I want to aim to be a pastry chef while learning from you. If you gave up because you're clumsy, it'll take a lot of determination. You'll have to work extremely hard. I didn't sugarcoat it. Lynn lifted her face and looked at me. Her long eyelashes came so close that I thought they might touch me. I'm moving in here from today, she declared with teary eyes. What? Wait a minute. Her unexpected words left me flustered. Lynn, still staring at me, pleaded, I want to practice day and night. I want to spend my time here watching your work. Please. As I stood there bewildered, Lynn stood up. Besides, I studied business management in college and my work experience could be useful. How about that? Switching from the polite and humble attitude she had when asking to be my apprentice, Lynn now confidently pitched herself. Business management, hospitality. These were all areas I was lacking in and worried about. I accepted her offer and said, please, I look forward to working with you. From then on, Lynn helped with the restaurant preparations while I taught her how to make sweets. However, true to her word, her clumsiness was extraordinary. Even cutting fruit made me nervous about her hands. This is going to be difficult, it's going to take a lot of time. But one night, when I got up to use the restroom, I saw that Lynn, who had gone to bed earlier, was up and reviewing what I had taught her that day. Her eyes were slightly teary, and she wiped away the tears before continuing. Seeing that, I made up my mind to turn her into a first-class pastry chef. Lynn was working as hard as she could, but progress was slow. While teaching her, I felt a sense of discomfort. I couldn't identify the reason and felt frustrated for a few days. One day, I noticed something off about the way she opened a jar. Observing her more closely, I finally understood. She used her left hand a lot. Opening jam jars with her left hand had felt strange. She used her left hand to take out coins. Even when picking up fruit, she used her left hand. Seeing that, I did a bit of research and then asked Lynn with confidence. Lynn, are you left-handed? Were you forced to switch? Lynn froze at my question. She insisted it couldn't be, but she decided to ask her mother just in case. The answer was, bingo. She had been forced to switch from left-handed to right-handed when she was three. We decided to try training her left hand. Apparently, four people originally left-handed, 
training the left hand could make it more functional. Indeed, within a month, many tasks became easier for Lin with her left hand, and her cream spreading skills for cakes, which she had struggled with, improved dramatically with her left hand. Both of us felt a surge of hope, like seeing a light at the end of a dark tunnel. A few months later, my new restaurant opened. It was a small place with just 20 seats when it's full. But the interior, decorated by Lin's sense, had a great atmosphere, and the exterior, which I worked hard on, turned out just as I imagined. Lin hadn't quite debuted as a pastry chef yet, but she was making some long-lasting sweets during the day and primarily working the floor. However, the baked goods served with coffee were well-received, and customers would exclaim delicious, with small cries of joy. Making Lin's eyes whiten and her expression soften. I could see the joy in her heart. We ended the first day with exactly the number of customers Lin had predicted, and we both stared at the sales sheet in amazement. Lin gave a small victory sign with a smug look. Sometimes Lin helped out in the kitchen too. When I was tearing vegetables, she watched intently. My veggies don't get fluffy like yours, Tom. Lin looked dissatisfied. But just noticing things like that showed she was growing. I taught her to tear along the fibers. When you don't stress the vegetables, they stay vibrant, I explained, and Lin smiled. It was an angelic smile. You're kind not just to the customers but to the vegetables too. I really respect that. She said, making me blush bright red. I realized I had developed feelings for Lin. I was surprised at myself. After all, she was like a strict drill sergeant when we first met. While I respected her professionalism, I never imagined considering her as a romantic interest. Just thinking about it seemed like it would make her furious. Yet, recently, she was so endearing. Her serious practice sessions were admirable, her support with management was impressive, and her smiles towards me were nothing short of angelic. But I was scared. If I confessed and got rejected, it would ruin our current relationship. I wanted to make her a first-class pastry chef, and I couldn't afford to lose her at the restaurant. I wanted her to be my special someone, but I couldn't take that step. One day, a turning point came for me. The doorbell rang, and both Lynn and I greeted the customer. The moment we looked at the entrance, Lynn exclaimed in surprise. Henry! Hearing her, I too looked closely at the man at the door. It was Henry, the owner of the restaurant Jewel where Lynn and I used to work. Henry looked completely worn out. Apparently, Juo was struggling. The quality of the food had dropped, the service had declined, and complaints were frequent while the number of customers dwindled. He had come to ask Lin to return, having traced her to my restaurant. When Henry asked Lin to come back, she responded firmly. I love this place that values its customers. I want to keep working here. Hearing that, my heart warmed. Henry then looked at me. I don't want to lose Lin either. Please, let's end this conversation here. I said, making my mind clear. With a sigh, Henry seemed ready to leave, but I nervously spoke up. Um, unless Stephen changes, it will be difficult. I talked to Henry about Stephen's lax attitude towards ingredient management and his lack of professionalism towards customers. Rather than getting angry at my criticism of his nephew, Henry listened carefully. When I finished, he said, I wish I'd known sooner, thank you and I'm sorry. I let my nephew handle everything. The food you made today. It was truly delicious. It wasn't just skill, I felt your passion. I was moved by food for the first time in a while. His words were more praise than I felt I deserved. I was genuinely happy. What if I asked you to come back to Jua as head chef, replacing my nephew? The sudden offer left me stunned. The head chef at Jua, it was a dream position. A place chosen for special occasions. A restaurant where I could make the happiest day for couples at weddings. It was like a dream come true. But, I love the work I'm doing now with Lynn, welcoming a small number of customers with care, and it makes me happy. I said, looking Henry straight in the eye as I declined. Lynn seemed a bit surprised. Henry didn't press further. I need to go give my nephew a talking to, he said, storming out. I kind of wanted to see that. Was that okay? It was a big opportunity. After lunch, Lynn and I took a break with the coffee she brewed and the cookie she made. I tried to imagine it, and it was tough. 
What was? Lin asked the obvious question, and I joked. Thinking about you becoming a strict drill sergeant again gave me chills. Lin blushed and pouted. Oh, come on. As she started to leave her seat, I grabbed her hand. Lin looked surprised. You shine so brightly when you're interacting with customers here. I want you to always be here, smiling and welcoming them, I said. Lin's eyes glistened with tears. I took a bite of the cookie she made. This cookie is amazing. Lin's face lit up with a smile. I could eat this for the rest of my life. I said, taking the step I had been hesitating to take to change our relationship. Henry's praise and his big offer had given me the courage. Now I could say it. Would you stay here and someday become my wife and support me? Lin blushed deeply and responded with a mix of seriousness and a light-hearted tone. If you're okay with having a strict drill sergeant as your wife. I laughed and hugged her. Five years later. Our quiet little restaurant, tucked away in an alley, had grown to be featured in magazines as a hard-to-book spot. I continued to cook as always. Lin, now a skilled pastry chef, handled all the desserts. And our staff had grown by one. Here you go. In her slightly lisping voice, our daughter Hannah, who joined us three years ago, offered individually wrapped colorful heart candies to the customers. The customers exclaimed in delight at the candies. Mommy made them. Hannah announced proudly, earning more admiration from the customers. Lynn blushed slightly. My husband was originally good at making sugar art, but I wanted to learn too, so he taught me. Lynn introduced me as her husband. It made me feel a bit embarrassed. Photos of our sugar art decorated the walls of the restaurant, and when customers learned that both Lynn and I had made them, they were impressed. Mommy's cakes are really delicious too. Hannah said, promoting our desserts to the customers. It's impressive how she manages to secure additional cake orders like that. Maybe she has a knack for hospitality, or maybe I'm just a proud parent. The customers mentioned wanting to visit Jua, the nearby restaurant where we used to work. The restaurant Jua has now a new head chef's and is now running smoothly. I don't know what happened to Stephen. But he was cast aside by Henry. I can't imagine how that must have felt. As I was lost in thought, I heard Hannah's cheerful voice saying, thank you very much. The satisfied customers said, thank you for the meal, as they left the door. Lynn, Hannah, and I greeted to their departing backs. After the door closed, the three of us exchanged smiles and laughter. Someone, please help. Help my daughter. In the midst of the chaotic accident scene, a particularly loud scream echoed. When I looked in that direction, I saw a woman cradling a collapsed girl, desperately calling for help. Call an ambulance quickly. The mother got clearly panicked and she was already in a state of hysteria. I had been a doctor until recently, but I had quit for various reasons. I had returned to my hometown for a fireworks festival when this accident happened. Many people were screaming, it hurts, help me. In that chaos, I approached the woman and checked on her daughter's condition. However, this encounter would significantly change my life. Doctor, thank you for your hard work. Good job. I had just finished a laparoscopic surgery for an inguinal hernia and left the medical office to get a checkup. My name is David Smith. As a pediatric surgeon, I have performed numerous operations at this hospital. What were the results? The CT scan confirms it's a dissecting aneurysm. I see. I had always suffered from frequent headaches. Headaches were a regular occurrence for me, and I had become accustomed to living with them. However, recently, the pain had increased frequently, and since entering my 30s, I experienced headaches at least twice a week, treating them with painkillers while examining the children. But as the pain became more persistent, I had my cardiologist colleague, Dr. John Williams, examine me, and that was the diagnosis. You've been too busy lately. Aren't you overworking yourself? The situation in the pediatric department was challenging, with many female doctors leaving due to childbirth or marriage. Recently, another pediatrician left for maternity leave, increasing my workload even more. I was aware of my health deteriorating, but with the shortage of doctors, taking a break was out of the question. I'm telling you, this hospital will soon close its pediatric ward. You should consider stepping away for a bit. 
The hospital had decided to close the pediatric ward due to financial constraints. Discussions were already underway to eliminate the pediatric department entirely. Some pediatricians had already left, knowing this, and either moved to other hospitals or started their own practices. Those remaining were also contemplating their next steps. Yeah. I think I'll step away for now. I was among them, deciding to leave due to my health. In June that year, the board officially decided to close the pediatric ward in April of the following year. I resigned at the end of March. With the nationwide shortage of pediatricians, I received offers from various places but politely declined, wanting to take a break from the field. I decided to return to my hometown to think about my future. It's been years since I took a train. I usually traveled by car, so riding the train was a rare occurrence. Especially the current high-speed train, which I hadn't ridden in decades. As I rested my elbow on the window seat and gazed at the swiftly changing scenery, memories of the past resurfaced. David, you should become a doctor in the future. You need to get into a medical school with a high national exam pass rate. There's no time to waste. I had always excelled academically in my hometown, so my parents and the adults around me would say, you'll be a doctor in the future. And I naturally began aiming for medical school. How did it go? I passed. Really? That's great. On my way back from reporting my high school acceptance, I ran into my classmate, Emily, and told her the news. Now you'll become a doctor, David. It's still uncertain, there's the national exam to pass first. With your abilities, David, you'll definitely pass. However, even after getting into medical school, I struggled with whether this was truly the right path for me. Just because I excelled academically didn't mean I had a strong sense of justice or mission. I had chosen this path merely because my parents had suggested it. Was it right for me to take on a job where I would be responsible for people's lives? I actually want to be a veterinarian. But my parents insist that I have to be a doctor. You love animals, David. How's Whiskers? Oh, he's completely spoiled by my mom. Haha, <laughs> is that so? If being a doctor doesn't suit me, I have nothing else. People only praise me because of my grades, in reality, no one cares about me. Without a strong desire to be a doctor, I often wondered what would be left for me if this path didn't work out. Ever since I decided to pursue medicine, I constantly pondered these thoughts. David, you'd make a great doctor. Remember when I got injured and you helped me? You were so reliable. I think people would feel safe with a kind doctor like you. She had tripped while running by the river during track practice, and I had happened to be nearby and gave her basic first aid. She still appreciated that moment. Are you going to get a job? With your grades, you could easily get into a national college. Maybe you should reconsider your path? No, I've thought it through. Thank you for your concern, Mr. Johnson. Our high school was one of the top schools in the area. Emily, a top student, had chosen to work immediately after graduation to support her single mother. If you want to do something else later, you can think about it then. If you want to come back, you can. People like you not just because of your grades but because they enjoy being around you. She was always so grounded. Unlike me, constantly second-guessing myself, she never wavered from her decisions. I had always been drawn to her steadfastness and her cheerful, sun-kissed face. But back then, I didn't have the courage to express my feelings and pretended to only care about my studies. Remembering those days, I wondered how Emily was doing now as I watched the scenery pass by. It's been so many years. Not much has changed. I exited the ticket gate at my hometown station and looked around. The video rental store I used to visit was gone, but everything else in the rotary was just as I remembered. It took about 40 minutes on foot to get from the station to my parents' house. I walked slowly, reminiscing about the familiar scenery. This is where I found Whiskers. I approached the small forest on the nostalgic path. In high school, I had found a stray kitten, Whiskers, in this forest. Bringing home a stray kitten. What if it's sick? You need to take it back. I begged my parents to let me keep the kitten I had brought home, but they were initially strongly opposed. However, I couldn't abandon the tiny kitten that fit in the palm of my hand so I persisted in asking to keep it. Eventually, my relentless pleading wore them down. 
and they reluctantly agreed to let me keep the kitten on the condition that I took full responsibility for its care. Mom, is dinner ready yet? Wait a little longer. I'm cooking now. Mom, why are you still holding whiskers? I'm hungry. Shh. Be quiet. Whiskers is sleeping right now. Whiskers was happily resting on my mom's lap, enjoying being petted under the chin. Less than a year after we started keeping the kitten, my mom fell completely in love with Whiskers and took over its care. Mom, you told me to take care of it, but now you won't even let me touch it. You used to tell me not to let it into the living room. And now you watch it run around the house with a smile. People can really change, can't they? Whiskers lived happily in our home for over 10 years, spoiled by my mom. During my busy internship, Whiskers passed away. I found out from an unexpected early morning call from my mom. Mom, what is it? It's so early, I was up late last night and I'm still sleepy. Sniff. David. Whiskers passed away. I remember my mom crying on the phone for several minutes. She called early that morning, crying her heart out. As I reminisced about those old days, I realized I had arrived at my parents' house. Welcome home. You got here sooner than I expected. My mother, who greeted me, had more white hair and a slightly hunched back. She seemed to have aged a bit since Whiskers passed away. Where's dad? He's at work right now. Though my father had retired, he continued working on a re-employment basis, constantly complaining about the significant pay cut. From that day on, I decided to relax at my parents' house for a while. By the way, David, isn't Robert your classmate? He opened a cafe last year. You should drop by if you have time. Robert? He opened a cafe? Robert was a high school classmate and a good friend for the first and second years. Unlike me, who wasn't in any clubs, he was a short distance runner in the track team and incredibly fast. I'll go check it out and see how he's doing as a cafe owner. With a laugh, I left my parents' house and walked leisurely to Robert's cafe. Is this the place? Haha, <laughs> what a stylish shop, doesn't seem like him at all. I opened the door with a strawberry red exterior and a harmonized wooden door, triggering an antique doorbell to chime. Welcome. The voice that greeted me from the counter is Robert, now looking like a grown man. Long time no see. How have you been? You? David, is that you? Wow, it's been ages. Hey, Ashley. It's David. David's here. Wow, David, long time no see. You've grown up. Ashley, another classmate, emerged from the back. We had been particularly close in high school, often hanging out together. Ashley? Wow, you haven't changed at all. Right? Still as pretty as ever, don't you think? Yeah, you're right. Ha ha, if you haven't changed, it means you haven't grown at all. What? Like I don't want to hear that from someone with a receding hairline. What did you say? Seeing this scene reminded me of the past. In high school, the two of you always fought, and we always had to step in to stop you. Emily and I. By the way, since you two are together, does that mean? Yeah, we got married. She insisted on staying by my side, so I had no choice. Oh really? Who was it again that said we'd walk hand in hand even when we were old? Even back then, it was obvious that the two of them liked each other, despite their constant bickering in the classroom. They couldn't express their feelings honestly, so they communicated through their arguments instead. In a way, I envied that. I couldn't express my feelings, nor could I argue. I always pretended not to care about the one I liked. Hey, there's a fireworks festival by the riverbank tomorrow. Let's go together. Wow, they're still holding that festival? Yes, we go every year. Come with us, David. Oh, I have something nostalgic for you. Ashley went to the back of the shop and brought out a photo. Look, remember this? It was a photo from the high school fireworks festival, showing the four of us. Next to Emily in her summer dress, I was smiling awkwardly. Back then, the four of us went to many places. You two always stopped us from fighting. By the way, David, why didn't you meet Emily on graduation day? Oh. I had to meet one of my dad's acquaintances. 
I forgot about it. That reason was true, but in a way, it was also a lie. I wanted to go that day, but I was afraid to face reality and used my father's appointment as an excuse to run away. As these memories flooded back, the events of that day replayed in my mind. David, can you make some time today? Uh. I think I can. Okay, I'll be by the riverbank. In truth, I didn't care about meeting my dad's acquaintance, I wanted to see Emily. Dad, can I go out for a bit today? I have something to do. What are you talking about? The son of my acquaintance is your senior at the college you're attending. We're going to get some information. Hurry up and get ready. It'll only take a little while. Don't make me repeat myself. Hurry up. One reason was that I simply couldn't defy my father back then. Emily waited alone until 8 p.m. that night, thinking she had to tell you how she felt or she'd never get another chance. What? I remember the meeting was supposed to be in the afternoon. She waited that long? I was so mad that you stood Emily up, David. I went to your house several times. I remembered my mom mentioning something during my internship. I had moved away to attend a distant college right after high school. Ashley often came to my house asking for my whereabouts. But my mom, thinking it would disrupt my studies, never told her. Back then, if we had the convenience of phones like we do now, I could have explained why I couldn't meet Emily. So, what's Emily up to now? She got a job right after graduation and had a shotgun wedding with someone she met at work, but they soon divorced. And it's all your fault. David. Hey, cut it out. David had his reasons. But it's true. A shotgun wedding? Hearing that phrase made my blood run cold. Emily was really down after not seeing you at graduation. She met someone at her job who was kind to her, and they started dating. Ashley looked down, hesitant to continue. She got pregnant a few months into the relationship. She even came to me for advice, but I didn't know what to say, so I told Robert instead. I felt an intense shock. Hearing about the shotgun wedding and pregnancy made my chest tighten with pain. They got married quickly, but the guy turned out to be a player. He was cheating and even hit her. They divorced within six months. As Ashley said, maybe it was really my fault. For such a solid person like Emily to let someone like that into her life. Emily came back three years ago and lives here with her child. Her kid goes to an arts high school. So she's here. We've only seen her once since then and haven't met again. Since she's been working hard as a single mother to support her high schooler, we've been mindful and haven't reached out to her. You probably have a lot on your mind, but she's doing her best. Just leave her be. Yeah, I understand. By the way, doctors make good money, right? Our cafe keeps us busy but doesn't make much. We started this cafe because we wanted to, not to make money. But I'd like to travel abroad. Come on. As usual, the couple started bickering, and I stepped in to mediate. Then came the day of the fireworks festival. Robert, Ashley, and I went to the riverbank. It's just as crowded as ever. Maybe more than last year. This normally spacious riverside was now packed with people. Hey, I want a cotton candy. You've always liked that, haven't you? As night fell, the lanterns lit up the festival stalls. Amidst the laughter of people and the lively shouts of vendors, the three of us enjoyed the festival atmosphere while eating cotton candies. The best view is from that bridge, but it looks like that's not an option today. Robert looked disappointed as he saw that the bridge was already crowded with people. Let's sit here. Ashley quickly claimed a spot on the riverbank just big enough for the three of us. Maybe I should have bought some beer. Should I go get some now? It's too late now, let's do it later. As they were talking, a sudden, deafening boom echoed, sending a shockwave through our bodies. Countless sparks exploded in all directions, lighting up the entire area. The crowd erupted in cheers. No matter how old I get, the sound never gets old. As Robert watched the fireworks, Ashley nestled close to him. You two get along pretty well, don't you? I smiled as I watched their happy faces illuminated by the fireworks. David, why don't you come over for dinner tonight? Ashley's cooking is pretty good. Come on, flattery won't get you anywhere. Suddenly, the sounds of people screaming filled the air. 
Ah! Oh my god! What's going on? We looked towards the source of the noise and saw that a stall near the bridge had been blown apart. Flames were rising from some of the stalls. I saw it! A firework shot sideways and hit that stall. A witness was shouting about what had happened. Later investigations revealed that a misfired firework had exploded sideways from its tube, hitting the stalls near the bridge. Looking at the bridge, I saw several people lying on the ground. I'm going over there. I pushed through the panicked crowd towards the bridge. Excuse me, please let me through. When I finally reached the bridge, I found debris scattered everywhere and many people lying injured. Ouch, ouch, it hurts, it hurts. Her clothes are on fire. Somebody help putting it out. What are you doing? Call an ambulance. There were people bleeding from their faces, some desperately trying to extinguish the flames on their clothes and others who seemed unconscious from severe head injuries. It was like a scene from hell. Sorry, I'm taking these. I grabbed several large water bottles from a nearby stall and poured water on a burned child. With so many injured, I didn't know where to start, so I decided to help the children first. It hurts, it hurts so much. It's hot, help me. Amidst the groans of pain, I worked frantically. Damn it, there are too many people. I can't handle this alone. David. We'll help too. Robert and Ashley called out as I poured water on a child's burns. Thanks. Robert, check on the people who aren't moving and see if they're conscious. Ashley, bring all the water bottles you can find. Got it. I'll go get it. Other bystanders also started helping on their own. Someone, please help. My daughter. My daughter got injured. A woman's voice shouted loudly amidst the chaotic scene. Looking in that direction, I saw a woman holding a collapsed girl, desperately calling for help. Where did it hit? Her arm. Her arm is burning. When I sat down in front of the girl to examine her arm, I saw that the high school-aged girl's right arm was swollen and red, with the skin blackened and charred. This burn. It's severe. I looked around for something to use. Then I spotted some unused aluminum foil that had been blown from a stall. Ah, it hurts. It hurts so much. Just hang in there for a moment. Since the burn was extensive, I used the aluminum foil to perform a makeshift dressing to prevent infection. Oh no, what if her arm stops working? We need an ambulance. Samantha, Samantha. The mother got clearly panicked and she was already in a state of hysteria. Ma'am, please calm down. Your daughter's burn isn't severe enough to cause her arm to stop working. Who are you? Why are you wrapping her in aluminum? Call an ambulance now. The mother, her hair disheveled, was unable to calm down. What should I do? Samantha. Samantha. David, I got some ice from the shaved ice stand. Hey. Emily? Ashley handed me a bag of ice and then called out to the woman by name. Ashley? Ashley? Samantha is. Emily, holding her daughter and crying uncontrollably. Emily, David is a doctor. You're in good hands. David. Emily, her face wet with tears, looked at me in shock. David. Why are you here? I'll explain later. For now, we need to get her to the hospital for treatment. Just then, several ambulances arrived, and I went to the hospital with Emily. Upon arrival, Samantha was immediately taken to the operating room for treatment. A few minutes later, Dr. Anderson informed us that she would need to be hospitalized for further treatment. Is Samantha going to be okay? Will her arm move properly again? She'll be fine. There will be scars, but with rehabilitation, she'll regain movement in her arm. Relieved by Dr. Anderson's words, Emily collapsed onto the bench in the hallway. The burn is severe, but it could have been much worse. If the firework had hit directly. If something happened to Samantha, I wouldn't be able to go on. Thank goodness, really, thank goodness. In the quiet hospital hallway, Emily, hunched over and dejected, looked very different from the healthy image I remembered. She was thin and appeared very fragile. Her daughter must be her only reason to live. 
During my time as a resident doctor, I encountered many cases like this. I've witnessed the heart-wrenching cries of parents who lost their children despite our efforts. Even though I don't have children, being in those situations made me feel crushed by my own helplessness. I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you, David, and I said some harsh things. It's okay. I didn't recognize you either. Anyone would be frantic with their child in that condition. I couldn't think straight and froze up. If you hadn't been there, I would have lost it completely. Thank you, David. I just did what anyone would do. Let me take you home. You need to prepare for her hospital stay. I called a taxi and took her home. You must be surprised to see I have such a big kid. In the taxi, Emily suddenly started to talk. I had a child with a guy I met at work after graduating. We got married quickly, but he had a cheating habit. We divorced within a year. Since then, it's just been me and my daughter. I remembered Emily saying she wanted to get a job right after high school to support her mother. How's your mom? She passed away three years ago. She moved in with me after my divorce, but she got sick. By the time we found out, it was too late. Seeing her so lonely brought back memories of the past. Emily, are you going to college? No, I'm going to get a job. I want to become a sports trainer and surprise my mom by working with famous athletes. Back then, Emily was on the track and field team with Robert and was a long jumper. She wanted to become a trainer to make her sports-loving mother happy. She was always tanned, active, and cheerful. But now, Emily looked like a woman exhausted by life. The sparkle she once had was completely gone. She must have been through a lot. Hey, if there's anything I can do to help, don't hesitate to ask. I'm planning to stay at my parents' place for a while. What? I told her I would support her, but I couldn't look her in the eyes and turn to gaze out the window. David, you visited me again? Yeah, I was worried about you, Samantha. How is she? It still hurts, but I can lift my arm a bit now. Look. Ouch. Hey, hey, don't overdo it. It's not fully healed yet. Ha ha. Samantha scratched her head with her other arm, wincing from the pain of moving too quickly. Since Emily worked hard during the day, I frequently visited Samantha in the hospital. I'm terrible at math. Can I stop now? Nope. Even if you're missing school, you need to learn the basics. Plus, math is used in art too, so you need to master it to create good work. Art doesn't use math. While Samantha was hospitalized, I tutored her during my visits. But she often grumbled when it came to her least favorite subjects. David, thank you so much. Samantha seems to be smiling more these days. She says she's happy you help her with her studies. Haha, <laughs> she complains but still studies. Knowing I was the one who helped her, Samantha seemed to have opened up to me. I often updated Emily on Samantha's progress after she finished work. Whenever I visit her in the hospital, she always talks about you. She asks about your favorite foods, your favorite books, and what kind of women you like. I just listen and nod since I know you pretty well. Haha, ha, everything I tell Samantha gets reported back to you. Emily, really, if you need anything, don't hesitate to ask. I'm here for you. Thanks. Just having you nearby gives me strength. It really helps a lot. Looking into Emily's eyes at that moment, my heart raced and I felt my feelings for her growing stronger. Hey. Samantha? One day, as I visited Samantha, I found her sitting on a bench outside. You're out today? The weather is nice. It feels good to get some fresh air, right? But for some reason, she seemed down. I noticed she had a notebook in her hand, probably for drawing. Oh. You're already practicing drawing again. That's great. I sat beside her, but she didn't look up. Hey, what's wrong? Are you worried about something? I can't do it anymore. My drawings are terrible, and I can't apply any strength. What if I can't draw anymore? What will I do then? She showed me her drawing, which didn't meet her expectations. This realization had deeply shocked her, filling her with anxiety. If this continues, she might end up not going back to school or worse, falling into depression. 
you don't need to rush. With proper rehabilitation, your strength will return. You'll be able to draw plenty once you're back in school. I am doing it. But rehab is so painful that I can't keep up. I see. Rehab must be really tough for her. Drawing is what makes school fun for me. If I can't draw, no one will pay attention to me at school. I tell mom I'm okay with a smile. But I know I won't be able to go to college. I can't. I can't. I can't do it anymore. Trying not to worry Emily, she must have forced herself to smile until now. She broke down, burying her face in her hands and crying. Samantha originally loved drawing and had entered an art-focused high school aiming to get into an art college. Her strong-willed behavior to avoid worrying her mother reminded me of how Emily was in high school. Even when she wasn't feeling well, Emily never skipped activities and pretended to be fine so her mother wouldn't worry. They really are mother and daughter. I'll help you until you can draw properly again. Let's work hard together, okay? I'll help with the rehab too. Besides, everyone likes you not just because you can draw, but because they enjoy being with you. Don't worry, everything will be alright. I found myself using the same words Emily had once said to me to encourage Samantha. You'll do the rehab with me? Yes. I'll be by your side until you can move your arm again. Let's do this together, okay? Okay. At that moment, I had no idea that Emily was watching us from the shade of a nearby tree. Hum. Ah. All right, keep going. Just three more times. Since then, Samantha had been working hard on her rehabilitation. She no longer said negative things and continued her rehab diligently. Watching her struggle through the pain to lift her arm, I found myself encouraged by her determination. I felt my desire to work with children as a doctor once again growing stronger. Congratulations on your discharge, Samantha. Congratulations, Samantha. Thank you. Blushing and smiling shyly, Samantha got into the taxi with Emily and me. Her rehab had gone well, and although the burn scars remained, her arm could move as it did before. From now on, she'll only need outpatient care. This means I won't have a reason to see Emily as often. Let's celebrate your discharge today. Samantha, you can choose whatever you want to eat. Really? Yay! We went to an Italian restaurant at Samantha's request, and while we waited for our food, we had some light conversation. Were you and mom close in high school? Did you ever think about dating her? Whoa! What are you saying all of a sudden? Samantha's sudden question almost made me spit out my water. I think you two would be a good match. Stop saying silly things, or I'll really get mad. Seeing Emily turn bright red, Samantha grinned mischievously. Hey, our food is here. Let's eat. Changing the subject, huh? I quickly diverted attention to the food that had arrived. After a while, Samantha brought up another surprising topic. I want David to be my dad. David, how do you feel about my mom? What? Gasp. Emily made a strange noise while I almost choked on my pasta. Looking at Samantha with teary eyes from my mishap, I saw her staring at me seriously. My mom talks about you with such joy. I've never seen her so happy before. I think she must like you. Since I don't have a dad, I thought it would be great if you could be my dad. So, what do you think? Both Emily and I were speechless, our faces turning red. Samantha's words gave me the courage I needed. I decided to face Emily and speak up. Um, if you can forgive me for what happened back then. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. Just as I began to speak, a sudden, intense pain shot through my head. This pain was different, far worse than usual. David? What's wrong? Mom. He collapsed. With a loud crash of a falling plate, I collapsed to the floor. David. David. After that, I lost consciousness. Uh. When I came to, I found myself lying in a hospital bed. An IV was attached to my arm, and my head throbbed slightly. Looking around, it seemed I was in a private room. David? Then, I saw Emily's face peering down at me. Emily, what happened to me? You collapsed at the restaurant. I didn't know what to do. 
Apparently, I had passed out at the restaurant and had been brought to the same hospital where Samantha was admitted. The doctor said you'll be fine if you rest for a while. Thank goodness. I was so scared of what might happen to you. I've had a condition with my head for a while, so you don't need to cry so much. Emily's tears kept streaming down her face, and she sobbed uncontrollably. You cried when I told you about Whiskers passing away too. Uh. You were saying something at the restaurant. What was it? Emily, her eyes red from crying, asked me. There's nothing to be afraid of anymore. Don't let it end in regret. Just tell her how you feel. I urged myself inwardly to express my feelings clearly. I've been attracted to you since high school, Emily. But I never had the courage to tell you. If you can forgive me for what happened back then, I'd like to stay by your side. Emily started crying again, unable to speak. You don't have to decide right away. When you're ready, let me know. Oh, right, it's hard to decide anything while I'm in this state. Have you woken up, David? I looked towards the voice and saw Dr. Anderson and Samantha entering the room. Your condition is temporary, so don't worry. I've already explained everything to you, and it's not serious. Once you've recovered. Please join us as a part-time doctor. Yes, thank you. As Dr. Anderson and I talked, Samantha whispered something to Emily. David is going to be a doctor here. Here? During Samantha's rehab, I had spoken with Dr. Anderson about working at this hospital. Given the shortage of pediatricians, the hospital was eager to have me, and the arrangements had been made quickly. That's great, Mom. David just confessed to you, didn't he? What? You heard of it? Sorry, we didn't mean to eavesdrop, but Samantha wouldn't let me into the room, so we overheard. Realizing that both Samantha and Dr. Anderson had overheard our conversation at the door, Emily and I fell silent with embarrassment. All right, next. Oh, ha ha. Okay, call her in. Samantha. When the nurse called, Samantha opened the door and entered the examination room. Samantha, you're in college now. You can go to a regular dermatologist. My doctor is Dr. Smith, and that's fine with me. Samantha, smiling, showed she could move her arm as before. As a result for her hard work, she had been accepted into an art college. Art colleges are more expensive than regular ones. Although I offered to pay for her tuition from my savings, Emily insisted on using her own savings, along with the money left by her mother. To cover the costs. Let me do something for you too. So now, I'm helping support their living expenses. After Samantha was discharged, she underwent skin graft surgery at a college hospital through my connections. Now, she comes to me for follow-up checkups. Let's arrange for another checkup at the college hospital next month. Yes, Dr. Smith. Also, I'm sure you know, but today is mom's birthday. I know. I'll come home as early as possible, so keep the preparations a secret from your mom. Okay. Leave it to me. With a happy smile, Samantha left the examination room. You have a lovely daughter. Yes, she's become quite the talker lately, always getting the better of me. After I was discharged from the hospital, I once again conveyed my feelings to Emily. I've always loved you too. Holding Emily quietly, I decided never to regret anything again. Although Samantha says she's fine with us getting together now, we've agreed to make it official once she becomes independent. Please call the next patient. Yes, doctor. At night, picturing Emily's face smiling happily after receiving her gift, I switched my mind to the pediatrician. I placed the stethoscope on the belly of a crying baby.